Euromax highlights coming up on the show. From Russia with class, a young conductor from Moscow makes his German debut in Dresden. Made to measure, container architecture is booming across Europe. Up, up and away, take to the skies in a hot air balloon. Euromax highlights. And here's your host, Karen Helmstedt. Greetings from the German capital. And we're starting off with our lovable local symbol here in Berlin, and that is the bear. Not only do visitors find these colorful and individually painted bears dotted all over town, but meanwhile, you might even have come across some of them elsewhere in the world. And should you find them in large numbers? Well, that will be the United Buddy Bears, as they're known, who for seven years now have been on a world tour promoting peaceful coexistence between countries. Well, right now they're in the capital of Kazakhstan. Stan Astana. These plastic sculpted bears come from Germany, Honduras, and Greece. They've arrived in the center of Astana, the capital of Kazakhstan. The project organizers have made the trip from Berlin. Astana is the 18th stop for Klaus and Eva Herlitz. Since 2004, the bears have been a sensation for some 20 million people on five continents. The success has come as a surprise. After the original one-off exhibition in Berlin in 2002, thousands of people wrote in to call for a continuation of the project. I think the symbolism is easy to comprehend, and after a short time you understand that all countries are represented, and all countries are represented by an artist from that country. You can see the differences in style from culture and religion, from history and tradition. That's why it's so fascinating. As always, the hosts put the Berlin Bears in the best spot they could offer. We always exhibit in the alphabet of the local language. The alphabet used depends on the language spoken in the country we are exhibiting in. So that leads to different constellations and who's holding hands with whom. I think it's especially nice that it's not always the same. In Kazakhstan, Kazakh is the official language alongside Russian. It presented an unusual challenge for the seven members of the United Buddy Bear team. Everything that we've published, as well as the information signs here, have been done in Russian, but we want to do it in Kazakh too. That was pretty difficult, because Kazakh has a lot of special characters, which our computer systems don't normally recognize. We had to draw eight or nine special characters ourselves and add them into the text. 2002 saw the start of the Buddy Bear project. Since then, the bears have traveled the world. They went to Hong Kong in 2004, to Sydney in 2006, and to Buenos Aires in 2009. Recently, the bears were back in Berlin at the new central train station. In mid-April, they were crated up for shipment to Kazakhstan. The trip to Ashtana was done by road. The bears are made of plastic. They weigh around 50 kilos each, and they're painted in weather-resistant colors. A heavy base plate keeps them rooted. The bear from Kazakhstan is a crowd puller here. So are the two gold-colored bears. I hope that when people get home and they look at these pictures again, that they'll remember the message of the bears, and not only the heart and the people standing between them. Maybe they'll think more about what we want to express with our project. That's my dream. The bears will remain in Ashtana till the end of July. Then they'll travel on to Finland. 
And now it's over to Saxony, where this week saw the start of the annual Dresden Music Festival. This is one of the biggest classic events on the continent, and since its inauguration in 1978, it has attracted some of the biggest names, from conductor Herbert von Karajan to pianist Hélène Grimaud. Well, it also showcases younger talent, and seeing as this year's theme is Russia and its rich musical heritage, a young Russian conductor did the honours to open the show. The sounds of Russian melodies fill the Dresden Zemper Opera. Up-and-coming conductor Mikhail Tatarnikov is making his German debut. Just hours before, the conductor and the Russian National Orchestra rehearsed together. The ensemble is performing its interpretation of Russian composer Sergei Rachmaninov's Second Symphony. It was written here in Dresden more than 100 years ago and belongs to the composer's best-known works. The vibrant notes are filled with passion and melancholy. For me, Rachmaninoff is like a, the, maybe the first genius of Russian music, I think. He's an absolutely Russian, but in the same time, he's absolutely international, you know, composer. And of course, I dreamed to conduct but I never dreamed to conduct with this orchestra because I think that is the best orchestra in the world. Dresden has a rich musical tradition with festivals dating back to the times of royal courts like at the Zwinga Palace. All of Dresden will become a stage. Last year, even one of Dresden's best-known landmarks, the Church of Our Lady, transformed into a classical music venue. Another one of the performance spots is Pilnitz Castle near Dresden. The world-famous boys' choir, the Dresdner Kreuzchor, will perform here. The theme of this year's festival is Russia. The Russian style of interpretation still differs from some of the styles you find in other parts of Europe, and I think that's beautiful. It's all part of the cultural differences, and the Russian National Orchestra is a great mix. It's a young orchestra, but a lot of the members studied in other countries and then returned to Russia, so they brought some of those experiences into the ensemble. But it's still characterized by that traditionally Russian extroverted style of interpretation that describes the entire breadth of life. The Russian National Orchestra was founded in 1990. Since then, the ensemble has performed in concert halls around the world, gaining an international reputation. In 2004, it became the first and remains the only Russian orchestra to win a Grammy. Today, the ensemble is counted among the top 20 orchestras in the world. I like to conduct on the concert and to give something new, so, surprise. I like it very much. I know that many, now many old conductors, oh, it's not, not, not occurring, but that's my way of conducting. With a flurry of notes, Mikhail Tatarnikov and the Russian National Orchestra kick off the Dresden Music Festival, bringing drama and energy to the audience. Listeners almost forget that Rachmaninoff's Second Symphony is actually considered a sorrowful piece. These young musicians are bringing a fresh perspective to an age-old classic. Well, from music to film, as all this week, the Cannes Film Festival was in full swing in the south of France. And while there were 18 movies in competition for the Palme d'Or, that wasn't the only competition going on. Every year, the most exclusive fashion labels and jewelers offer the film stars their gowns and gems to wear on the red carpet. And even if it's only a short-term loan, it does give them an extra special sparkle for just a few luxurious hours. 
Mirror, mirror on the wall, who's the fairest of them all? Or at least on the red carpet in Cannes. No dress is too extravagant, no piece of jewellery too dazzling for the world's most glamorous film festival. When I looked at the dress, I was like, wow, that's a real princess dress. This evening I had two choices for dresses and they gave me maybe um, ten different earrings that I could try on. Few of the stars strutting their stuff on the Quasette actually bought their finery. For the duration of the festival, representatives from all the main labels set up shop in the town's luxury hotels. There, they've invited film stars looking for something to wear. Berlin-based actress Anna Brueggemann is in Cannes for a few days and tonight she'll be at the Palais de Festival for a premiere. She's visiting the Swarovski suite in search of accessories and gets a complimentary bag while she's there. When you first arrive, it all seems very surreal. It's a complete suspension of the reality you're used to. In these situations, it's like I'm standing outside myself thinking, wow, this is fun. So far, Austrian company Swarovski has had a good festival. Their accessories have been worn on the red carpet by actresses from Eva Longoria to Ashwarya Rai. These pictures go all over the world, so we can show our customers that if they buy our products, they're getting something that the stars wear too. It's a definite boost to business. The dress worn by this actress is by Lebanese haute couture makers Elie Zab. The next day, the 30,000 euro gown was featured on the cover of a well-known German magazine. All the companies are represented at the same time in the same space. Naturally, competition comes into play. Everyone wants to make the greatest splash with their design. It's a good feeling when an actress has to select a dress from five or six and chooses one of ours. After the event, sadly, etiquette requires that the dresses are given back. When a celebrity has already worn an outfit, she can't wear it again. The magazines would get hold of it and it would be a real fashion faux pas. Film stars also get to borrow expensive jewellery for free. Jewellers Chopin and Di Gressigono also provide a bodyguard to go with it. The jewellery never leaves the house without a bodyguard. He stays with the actress until she goes to bed and then brings it safely back. Chopin has been one of the festival's main sponsors for 13 years. This year, the luxury brand is once again hosting prestigious events designed to attract celebrity guests and with them, the press. It's a worthwhile investment. Cannes is definitely an important festival. The only comparable event is the Oscars. But Oscar night is just one evening and Cannes is almost two weeks. Anna Brueggemann is at her first red carpet event at the festival. She's enjoying her expensive outfit, even if she will have to give it back in a few hours. A typical freight container is a practical rectangular space to transport goods from one place to another, normally. But in recent years, containers have taken on a whole variety of other functions. Some have been changed into art galleries, perhaps offices, bars, and even sophisticated housing. And thanks to such inspired and imaginative ideas, they're now a modern architectural phenomenon. From Container City in London and the student halls of residence in Amsterdam to the headquarters of the Freitag company in Zurich, container architecture is booming across Europe. German architect Hans Slavik and his team are at the heart of it. They've studied container constructions all over the world. Basically, we're fascinated by containers. They look anonymous, but they're anything but. They look different from every angle. You can do a lot with them, and they're fun to play with. 
Slavic's latest project is located on the River Elba, the IBA Dock, which is the bureau of the International Building Exhibition in Hamburg. With its 1,640 square meters that includes gallery space and offices, the floating venue was christened two weeks ago. What makes it special is that it doesn't consist of whole containers, but steel container frames. When you put containers next to one another, then you get double walls as well as double floors and ceilings. Our idea was to separate them. So what we do is take a frame like this one and we add on the ceilings, floors and walls where we want them. Essentially, the venue is a floating slab of concrete, 43 meters long and 26 meters wide. The steel skeleton made of container frames was assembled in just four weeks and filled with plasterboard. Although it has three stories, the IBA dock bobs comfortably on the water. The tide can carry it up to 3.5 meters every day. It has a lot of potential. Not only can it float, it can also be revamped and relocated to another dock. That could make it taller or lower. You can even change the facade and completely redesign the interior. It all began with a design for a student residence made of shipping containers. In 1986, it helped Hans Slavik win a competition for temporary architecture. His was the only entry based on recycled shipping containers. I realized that this sort of container was very cheap, considering how much space it ultimately offers. It's extremely stable. It weighs 2.4 tons and can carry a load of 24 tons. Eight of them can be piled on top of one another. Only when there's nine will it collapse, so there's really enormous potential. That's something the big multinationals have recognized. A container costs only about 1,300 euros. It also makes a unique statement, standing for efficiency, flexibility and international flair. Hans Slavik's prize-winning home box illustrates how portable buildings made from containers are. It's a miniature house with the dimensions of a container. It can fit into any empty building site in an urban area. It's easy to transport and put into position. Of course it's nicer when they're not just sitting flat and horizontal on a parking place. When you go in at the bottom, and then you sleep in the middle, and up in the tower there's a nice view. The container house is produced in series and costs 10,000 euros. And there are already some prospective buyers from five different countries. And now to a rather new sport that's rapidly gaining in popularity in Germany's Allgäu region. In the spring and summer months, this is a popular destination for hikers and mountain climbers. But now you can have the best of both worlds with something that's called balloon trekking. Now, this is a hybrid of hiking and hot air ballooning, and it allows nature lovers to venture where they've never been before. It's 6.30 in the morning. The participants are up bright and early, ready for their big day. They're here to go balloon trekking, a combination of riding in a hot air balloon followed by hiking. It was Helmut Scheuerle who invented the concept. He's an experienced balloon pilot. Many tourists come here to go hiking, but he wanted to offer them more. They only planned to go hiking, but then they got here and thought, this is really different. We only normally hike with maps on selected tours with a guide. With a balloon tour, we land somewhere and then we look on the map to find out where we are. The balloon trekking tour costs around 200 euros. First, everyone has to help set up the balloons, each 25 meters tall. My arms are going to fall off soon. Then the radio has to be tested to ensure everything's working OK. Everything's in order. Now the balloons worth about 75,000 euros each are ready to take to the skies. The 
balloon travels on the wind. Now and then, the propane gas burner fires up. But for most of the journey, the craft drifts silently through the air. After an hour and a half, the balloon touches down. Super. Einfach schön. It was beautiful. Just beautiful. Oder? Ja, sehr schön. Doch. Once back on the ground, they find out that they're about 10 kilometers from their starting point as the crow flies. So they have about a three hour hike back. Armed with compass and map, they set off. Finally, the group arrives back at their starting point. Wonderful, that was a new experience. A lovely day. Saw lots. Balloon trekking in Egloff's tire. Nearly eight hours of hiking and hot air ballooning. Everyone's tired, but it's been a day to remember. <laughs> And an artist to remember is Spaniard Manolo Valdez, who has absolutely no qualms about borrowing ideas from other artists. And in fact, he says his greatest inspiration comes from the vast body of art history itself. His striking and often monumental works can be seen in leading museums all over the globe. And even the Spanish king himself is a collector. Well, we met up with him in the Spanish capital, Madrid. <laughs> Manolo Valdez spends most of his time in New York, but he regularly returns home to Spain. Whether they're made from metal or wood, his biggest sculptures are created here in Madrid. This sculpture is intended for a library that's being set up in a former church. The sculpture will be placed where the altar once stood. In this industrial estate on the outskirts of Madrid, Valdez's employees weld, assemble, or cast his sculptures. Most of the larger pieces are made out of bronze. It requires a lot of preparatory work before the final cast is made. This is my New York studio. The maquettes here are 40 or 50 centimeters high. On this photo, the sculpture is bigger. It's four meters high here from 40 centimeters to 4 meters. And this is the final bronze version. The monumental sculpture La Dama del Manzanares, or the Lady of Manzanares, is a new landmark in southern Madrid. An example of public art that is accessible to people who rarely visit museums or galleries. In the northwest of the capital stands Valdez's Reina Mariana, or Queen Mariana. The pedestrian district in Murcia hosted a traveling exhibition with Valdez's works as part of a tour through Spain. The group Las Meninas attracted a lot of attention. It's not just the title that was borrowed from the great Spanish painter Diego Velázquez. The original 17th century painting hangs in the Prado in Madrid. It has inspired many artists to create their own interpretations. Many of Valdez's creations take other artists' works as their starting points. Artists really interest me, but I've probably concerned myself most with Rembrandt, Velázquez, and Giotto, and of the more recent ones, Matisse. They open doors for me and let me step inside. An exhibition in Madrid's Marlborough Gallery shows that Valdez has a very clearly defined repertoire. He enjoys creating different versions of the same motifs, varying the materials and colors he uses, sometimes creating sculptures, sometimes paintings. His ladies on horses also draw their inspiration from Velázquez. Valdez also produces smaller scale sculptures, masks that are reminiscent of African art, heads wearing crowns, a signature feature of Valdez's work. The motifs are almost identical, whether made from alabaster, wood, or bronze. All of my works make particular references, but the viewer doesn't necessarily have to recognize them. For example, this headwear alludes to some of Matisse's drawings. Recently, Valdez has tried his hand at something new, applied art in the form of silver jewelry. He's employed someone to help him. They're producing small series based on the artist's own sculptures. 
It's reminiscent of the Meninjas, isn't it? It's part of a necklace. People who know my work or collect it will probably buy this jewelry. The artist regards this experiment as little more than a sideline. He spends most of his time in Madrid, supervising the production of his sculptures. He's barely felt the impact of the global financial crisis. There is no shortage of orders, though it doesn't always have to be a definitive work, like the Lady of Manzanares. And just a reminder that you can find our Euromax highlights on YouTube. And with that, it's time for us to sign off. So until next time, take good care and thanks very much for watching. Bye-bye.